for learning outcome number four in module eight, we're going to be talking about how the nervous system will control the muscle tension. As you can imagine, to be able to move an object, which is referred to as a load, the sarcomeres, which are the functional unit of the muscle fibers, they're going to have to shorten. And the force that's generated by the contraction of the muscle or the shortening of the sarcomeres is what we call muscle tension. However, this muscle tension also is generated when the muscle is contracting against the load that does not move. And this will result in two main types of skeletal muscle contractions, which are the isotonic contractions and the isometric contractions. In an isotonic contraction, where isotonic means constant tension, the tension developed by the muscle is going to remain almost constant while the muscle changes in its length. Isotonic contractions are used for body movement and for also moving certain objects. The two types of isotonic contractions are the concentric and the eccentric. In concentric isotonic contraction, the tension that's generated is going to be great enough to exceed the load and the muscle will then shorten pulling on another structure, such as, for example, a tendon to produce this movement. So, for example, if you're lifting up this weight, this will involve concentric isotonic contractions of the biceps brachii muscle in the arm. By contrast, as you lower the weight, as seen here on this image, the previously shortened biceps brachii lengthens in a controlled manner while it continues to contract because it's still holding the weight. So when the length of a muscle increases during a contraction, the contraction is an eccentric isotonic contraction. And during an eccentric contraction, the tension that's exerted by the myosin cross bridges resists the movement of the load, therefore the weight in this case, and slows the lengthening process. On the other hand, an isometric contraction occurs as the muscle will produce tension without changing the angle of the skeletal joint. So the joint will remain the same as we see here on this image. In isometric contraction, the sarcomere will shorten and there's going to be an increase in muscle tension. However, the load will not move. And this is because the force that's produced cannot overcome the resistance that's provided by the load. In this example, this person is attempting to lift this weight that is way too heavy Therefore, there will be a sarcomere activation and shortening to a point, an ever-increasing muscle tension, but there's going to be no change in the angle of the elbow joint. An example of isometric contractions that occur in our day-to-day -day lives are the maintenance of the posture and the joint stability. Because when we're maintaining our posture, the angle of our vertebral column, for example, will not change, even though our muscles are still contracting. We have covered in details the formation of the cross bridges be between the myosin head and the thin filaments that contain the actin. So when a skeletal muscle fiber contracts, the myosin head will attach to the actin to form the cross bridges. And this is going to be followed by the thin filaments sliding over the thick filaments as the head of the myosin pulls the actin and this results in the sarcomere shortening as we can see by these arrows over here and also by the thinning of the eye band that we already covered and this sarcomere shortening is going to create the tension of the muscle contraction now these cross bridges they can only form where the thin and thick filaments already overlap. If they don't overlap, there will be no way for the myosin head to be able to attach to the actin filament, so that the length of the sarcomere has a direct influence 
on the force that's going to be generated when the sarcomere shortens. And this is what we call the length tension relationship. In the ideal length of a sarcomere, it's going to be important for us to see how much these sarcomeres will produce the maximal tension to allow for the shortening and contraction of the muscle. So we can say that the sarcomeres will produce this maximal tension when the thick and thin filaments overlap at about 80 to 120 percent. So let's see, right over here would be your 80 percent going up and over here would be your 120 percent. So at this range, that's the optimal or ideal length of a sarcomere. And as we notice over here with regards to the overlapping, where the purple would be the myosin and the green would be the actin filament or the thin filament, you can see that there's going to be a decreased length because the actin filament is already so overlapped on top of the myosin filament that there's nowhere for it to move towards the M line of the sarcomere. On the other end, there are no cross bridges that can be formed because there is no direct contact of the myosin head with the actin filaments. So therefore, it cannot form the cross bridges to be able to contract the muscle. So the ideal length is going to be right over here in the middle. As we can see, there is an overlap of myosin heads with the actin filament and there's enough room for the actin filament to move closer to each other towards the M line. So right over here in the middle that's where you're going to have the ideal length of a sarcomere to be able to perform muscle contraction. With regards to a twitch it's going to be a brief contraction of a group of muscle fibers within a muscle in response to a single action potential, producing a single contraction. And in a lab, a twitch can actually be produced by surgically removing a muscle from an animal and then electrically stimulating it. To be able to record the muscle contraction, they use an equipment that's called a myogram, that will measure the amount of tension over time that this muscle performs. With regards to the measurement of this twitch, it can last from a few milliseconds to a hundred milliseconds, and this will definitely depend on the type of muscle. A twitch is going to consist of three sequential phases. The first one is the latent period, the second one is the contraction period, and the last one is what we call the relaxation period. The latent period, which usually lasts about 2 milliseconds, is very brief delay that occurs between the application of the initial stimulus, therefore the time zero on the graph, and the beginning of the contraction. And during this time, the events of excitation and contraction coupling will occur. Therefore, the muscle action potential will sweep along the sarcolemma and into the T tubules, causing the release of calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Next, we have the contraction period. So during this contraction period, which usually lasts between 10 to 100 milliseconds, the calcium will bind to troponin and myosin binding sites on the actin are going to be exposed because the troponin is going to be able to move away as the calcium binds to troponin and the myosin cross bridges are able to form because the myosin head will be able to attach to the myosin binding sites on the actin. And as a result of this, there's a peak tension that develops in the muscle fiber. Next, we have the relaxation period, which also lasts about 10 to 100 milliseconds. But now the calcium is actively transported back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And therefore, the myosin binding sites are going to be covered again by the tropomyosin. And this means that the myosin heads are going to detach now from the actin 
and therefore the tension in the muscle fiber will be able to decrease. And the actual duration of these periods are definitely going to depend on the type of muscle fiber, which we will cover the different types of muscle fiber in the next learning outcome. A single nerve action potential in a somatic motor neuron, which is the one that will be present in the motor unit, will elicit a single muscle action potential in all the skeletal muscle fibers with which it forms synapses. And action potentials, they always have the same size in a given neuron or muscle fiber. By contrast, the force of muscle fiber contraction can vary. A muscle fiber is capable of generating a much greater force than the one that results from a single twitch. Therefore, the skeletal muscles can produce these graded contractions which are contractions that vary in strength depending on how much force is needed by the muscle to support a particular object. Therefore, we can conclude that there are two things that will affect the tension, the frequency of the action potential and also the number of motor neurons that are transmitting this action potential. The rate at which a motor neuron fires action potentials will affect the tension produced in the skeletal muscle. So if the fibers are going to be stimulated while a previous twitch is still occurring, then this means that the second twitch will be stronger because there's already a response that's occurring. So it sort of adds to the previous one. And this is why this response is called a wave summation because this excitation contraction coupling effects of successive motor neuron signalings are summoned or added together. And how this occurs at the molecular level has to do with the amount of calcium ions that's being released. This means that the calcium that's being released the second time around for the second stimulus will add on to the first stimulus. So the summation results in greater contraction of the motor unit. Now, if the frequency of motor neuron signaling increases, then the summation and the subsequent muscle tension in the motor unit will also continue to rise until it reaches a peak point. Therefore, the tension at this point is about three to four times greater than the tension of a single twitch. And this is a state that's referred to as an incomplete tetanus. During this incomplete tetanus, the muscle goes through this quick cycle of contraction with a short relaxation phase for each stimulus. If the stimulus frequency is so high that the relaxation phase disappears completely, then these contractions become what we call a continuous process that's called a complete tetanus. Skeletal muscles, they're rarely completely relaxed or flaccid. Even if a skeletal muscle is not producing movement, it is contracted a small amount to maintain its contractile proteins and produce muscle tone. This tension produced by muscle tone allows muscles to be continually stabilizing joints, for example, and also maintaining the posture. Muscle tone is going to be accomplished by a complex interaction between the nervous system and the skeletal muscles that will then result in the activation of a few motor units at a time. And most likely, this is going to happen in a cyclical manner. In this manner, the muscles never will get fatigued completely as some motor units can recover while others are going to be active. So they sort of alternate who's going to be working and who's going to be resting. Now the absence of these low level contractions that lead to muscle tone is referred to as hypotonia and can result from the damage to parts of the central nervous system, like for example, the cerebellum, or actually from loss of innervations to the skeletal muscles, as it occurs in a viral disease known as poliomyelitis. 
conversely, when you have an excessive muscle tone, it's going to be referred to as hypertonia. Hypotonia is often the result of the damage to the upper motor neurons in the central nervous system. And it can be present, for example, in individuals that have Parkinson's disease where their muscles are always very tense.